once again because we want to see Jesus. Open our eyes, open our ears, and open our hearts. In His name we pray. Amen. I have been gripped by the recent scenes of devastation that have taken place across our country with the stupendous number of natural disasters taking place. I saw some photos of a family sifting through the ashes of what used to be their home in Texas. Nothing left. Then there are those people who are mopping up after the devastating hurricane, Irene, that took place on the East Coast in places that have not been hit in decades, if ever before. And then my mind goes back to the scenes earlier this year in Japan. They were struck by a trifecta of disasters. An earthquake, a tsunami, nuclear fallout. And I'm sure that many of you, most of you perhaps, have seen the pictures left of those people. Nothing. Wandering aimlessly with, uh, through the streets with nothing but sticks and piles of bricks and loved ones gone. For many of those people, it was the last days. Indeed, we are living in some troublous times. And over the last few weeks, we have been dealing with a sermon series called Last Day Essentials. So far we've learned a couple of those Last Day Essentials. First of all, that going to the cross daily and accepting the merits of Christ's death in our behalf is essential number one. We refer to it as justification by faith. Last Sabbath, we talked about the need to daily invite Jesus to live his pure and holy life in us, recognizing that we are powerless to live a holy life. But Jesus longs to give us his mind and to live his holy life in us. We refer to that as sanctification by faith. These are key ingredients of righteousness by faith and essentials to last day living. But are there other last day essentials. I would invite you today, if you would please, open your Bibles to the Gospel of Matthew chapter 15. We're going to read an interesting story there, a story that I know you're familiar with. And we're going to discover some other last day essentials in this story that involve Jesus. Matthew chapter 15, and we want to begin with verse 32. Matthew chapter 15, beginning with verse 32. It's the story of Jesus feeding the 4,000. A story I'm sure that most of us are familiar with. Matthew chapter 15, beginning with verse 32. Now Jesus called his disciples to himself and said, I have compassion on the multitude, because they have now continued with me th three days and have nothing to eat and I do not want to send them away hungry, lest they faint on the way. Then his disciples said to him, Where could we get enough bread in the wilderness to fill such a great multitude? Jesus said to them, How many loaves do you have? And they said, Seven, and a few little fish. So he commanded the multitude to sit down on the ground. And he took the seven loaves and the fish and gave thanks, broke them, and gave them to his disciples, and the disciples gave to the multitude. So they all ate and were filled. 
And they took up seven large baskets full of the, of the fragments that were left. Now those who ate were about 4,000 men besides women and children. And he sent away the multitude, got into a boat, and came to the region of Magdala. As I mentioned, a story that most of us are familiar with. Jesus feeding the 4,000. There are some interesting points that I would like to, uh, uh, for us to observe in this story, in this account. Number one, it says here, Now Jesus called his disciples to himself and said, I have compassion on the multitude. Jesus had compassion on these people that were with him for three days. These people had, had, had been listening to him preach. These people had been, had been there. It was, it, it was a camp meeting of sorts. Uh, they were attending this occasion. And they had been listening to Jesus, and, and now they were out of food. Perhaps they weren't expecting there to be there that long. Just remember, if you, uh, if you get upset with your pastor for preaching too long, just remember that Jesus preached three days. He had compassion on the crowd, the Bible says. Their food supply was gone. They were hungry, and Jesus recognized the fact that they were hungry. He said, man, there's no way. He called his disciples. He says, listen, I'm not going to let these people go away hungry. Jesus wanted to feed them. Several years ago, in uh, my early pastoral ministry days, our, uh, our daughter Elizabeth was two years old. And we were out doing some pastoral visiting this particular, on this particular afternoon. And we stopped by to visit Grandpa and Grandma Trujillo. They were wonderful people. They had been in the church for years and years. And so we dropped by to visit Grandpa and Grandma Trujillo. And I'm going to guess it was probably along about 4.30, 5 o'clock in the afternoon. And we're sitting there in their living room, and we're having a wonderful time visiting. And uh, Elizabeth, two years old, she was just learning to talk. And, and so... Grandma Trujillo was asking her some questions. And Elizabeth, in her response, used the word please. Except Elizabeth couldn't pronounce her L's at that time, and so the, the word came out instead of please, it came out peas. Well, being the wonderful hostess and cook that Grandma Trujillo was, she immediately asked the question. She says, Peas, do you want some peas? She says, Are you hungry? And she looked at us, and she said, uh, you know, have you eaten? She looked at, at uh, Pastor Jan and I and asked us, have you eaten? Well, we weren't going to lie, we hadn't. And uh, we told her no, but we says, hey, listen, we're okay. No, 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 no. She says, we're not going to have this. And Grandma Trujillo kicked into high gear, and immediately she started making some wonderful food. Now, Grandma Trujillo is Hispanic uh, from New Mexico. And uh, that's where my mother's heritage comes from. And so Grandma Trujillo, in nothing flat, she's making up some fresh flour tortillas, okay? It was like killing the fatted calf, okay? She whips up some nice frijoles, some beans, wonderful. And she didn't stop with that. She made some potatoes with green chili. Oh, wow. It was wonderful. And of course, if you cleaned off your plate, there's Grandma Trujillo there making sure you had more on it. It was a wonderful experience. We came hungry and we left happy. You know, it, it, <laughs> after that experience, I tried to figure out how I could get my kids to continue that. So anytime I take them pastoral visiting, that, you know, we'd have a ready meal. Didn't always work. And now they're growing up, so if I come and visit you, I'm going to have to find another excuse to raid your refrigerator. So, Like Grandma Trujillo, Jesus saw the hungry crowd, 
and he didn't want them to leave unsatisfied. It would have been devastating if Grandma Trujillo would have found out later that we were hungry at her home and she didn't feed us. She was just that kind of person. And Jesus is the same way. Jesus saw these people that were hungry and he did not want them to leave unsatisfied. And so the disciples, they respond and they say, uh, look, Jesus, we're way out in the wilderness. Where can we possibly find enough food to feed the, this many people here? Now, it's interesting that the disciples would respond in that way. And here's the reason why. If you take a look at a harmony of the Gospels, you'll discover that Jesus fed the 4,000 after he fed the 5,000. So the disciples already had experience with Jesus feeding a large crowd basically taking something out of nothing and feeding a lot of people. And yet they have the audacity to, say, to ask Jesus a question, well, where on the earth is, is food going to come from out in this wilderness? There are no stores. Where are we going to come up with enough food? In the face of the fact that Jesus has fed 5,000 people, they're questioning his ability to feed 4,000. And yet Jesus simply asks them the question. He says, what are your resources? What do you have? How many loaves do you have? And their response is interesting. They said, we have seven and a few little. <laughs> Notice that descript, that adjective there? A few little fish. But notice what happens next. Jesus instructs all of these people to sit down. This crowd of 4,000 plus people, you know, the Bible says it was 4,000 men in addition to women and children, so there's no telling how many. There could have been, you know, there could have been eight to 12,000 people there. And Jesus instructs them to sit down and, 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 uh, and, and, and prepare. I grew up in eastern Washington state on a little farm. My dad had been raised on a farm and I think that he felt he needed to provide that kind of dynamic for, for his family and, and so my, my dad kind of considered him and has considered himself through the years to be a gentleman farmer and even though my father was a certified public accountant, um, he always had this little farm on the side. And we had horses, and we had cows, and we had chickens. And uh, it was my responsibility to feed them. And it was always interesting for me to watch the behavior of those animals when it came time to feed them. Very interesting what happens to animals when you start getting out the food. They, they, they all tend to hoard together. This past spring, we were visiting our daughter and son-in-law and our grandson on the occasion of his first birthday. At the time, my son-in-law was pastoring in South Dakota, and, and they were living in a farmhouse there. And uh, one particular morning, I, I got up, and I was, I was out uh, in their yard, and I was watching uh, this farmer who, um, who owned this, uh, this, this farmhouse and this whole spread, uh, he was coming to feed his cows, and they were in uh, this corral area, and there were several head of, of, of beef cows in there. He came with a big tractor full of grain and who knows what all else. And the minute that started up, and he started going by uh, to, to feed the cows, he turns this little auger on, and grain starts uh, spilling out into this trough. And all of the cows start herding together right there. I mean, they're just like trampling each other. You know, never mind the fact that this has happened countless times before, and you think they'd learn that, hey, just hang on a minute. He's going to come by, and he's going to fill the whole trough. Everybody can have an opportunity to eat, but not so. These cows are going crazy, man. They're knocking each other over, trying to get there to get the food. And you know what? I've discovered that humans are just the same way. And if you don't believe me, take a look at potluck after church. 
Jesus tells the disciples, hey, listen, we need to get all this crowd to sit down. Jesus gets them seated. And then Jesus performs a most amazing miracle. He gives thanks. He breaks the food. The, the, the food. He gives it to the disciples. And he asks them to give it to the people. And notice what the scripture says. Verse 37 of Matthew chapter 15. So they all ate and were filled. All of this came out of seven loaves of bread and a few little fish. But I want you to notice something else about this story. I, I want you to notice the quantity of food that was left over. It says, the Bible says here that they took up seven large baskets full of food at the end, after everyone was filled. Now, you know, most people hate to deal with leftovers. You know, I know my wife does. You know, there, there, there's, there's a couple of spoonfuls of, of, of something left in a dish, and she doesn't want to, to, to put it in the refrigerator, and so she's trying to convince Anthony and I, hey, you know, here, won't you, t you t eat this stuff? You know, many of us will end up after there are leftovers, we'll end up shoving it in a baggie or a Tupperware and stick it in the refrigerator and it'll be there for three weeks until it's growing hair on it and then we throw it out. We don't like to deal with leftovers. And so, it, let me ask you a question. Have you ever wondered why there, were so, there was so much food left over? after feeding the 4,000? I mean, stop and think about it, folks. If Jesus was powerful enough to take seven little loaves and a couple of little fish and feed 8,000 plus people with it, you think that he would have, had a, 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 would have been able to perform a miracle so that, so that there were absolutely no leftovers? Don't you think so? So why were there leftovers? Why was it that when this thing was all done, there were seven basketfuls that were taken up? Several months ago, Pastor Jan and I were uh, contemplating our ministry. And things uh, were seeming to be obvious to us that uh, if we remained where we were in Georgia, that we would likely not be able to continue in a team ministry together. Or both of us were full-time pastors, working side by side, as we have for many years. And uh, with the economy the way it was and things that were happening, it just appeared that that was not going to be in our future there. We began to pray about that. I've shared the story with many of you before. But let me say this. I prayed and I, I said, Lord, I know how powerful you are. And, and made a decision that it was nothing that I was going to discuss with anyone else. As I shared before, we sent out no resumes. We made no phone calls. We didn't email anybody. We didn't talk to anybody except Jesus about our challenge. And then in January, in January, on the very same day, something happened that had never happened before in my entire ministry. On the very same day, we received three different calls into ministry on the very same day. We only needed one. 
We received three. And I wondered about that, and I was sharing, the few days later, I was sharing with a friend. I said, you know, this just blows my mind. Three on the same day. And his friend said, Pastor Phil, you prayed about it, didn't you? And I said, yeah. Yeah, we prayed about it. And then she remarked in this way. She says, well, Jesus was just showing off. And I thought about what she said for a few minutes. Jesus was just showing off. Jesus wasn't showing off in an arrogant manner. He, he wasn't showing off to show off the way most of us humans like to show off. Uh-uh. And the same thing is true in this story. Jesus was just showing off. He was showing off his power and his majesty. He was trying to get a message out to the people there. Hey, listen, I can take care of all of your needs. You come hungry, and I promise you will leave happy. Jesus, is it amazing at doing that kind of thing? He wants to remind us that he is capable of taking care of all of our needs. He loves to give us that irrefutable evidence that he is in control, that he can take seven loaves and a couple of little fish and feed 8,000 plus people and have leftovers. With Jesus, there's always more than enough. In January 2003, International House of Pancakes, known today as IHOP, started an advertising slogan for their restaurant chain, Come Hungry, Leave Happy. Perhaps you've heard it. Maybe you've seen it in the newspaper or, you know, on the Internet, some pop-up on the Internet or television advertisement, Come Hungry, Leave Happy. At the 2004 Awards for Advertising and Marketing Effectiveness, the IHOP Corporation received a bronze medallion for its Come Hungry, Leave Happy advertising campaign. And in many respects, friends, I think it's the perfect slogan for Jesus. Amen? Come hungry, leave happy. Because in this story of Jesus feeding the 4,000 is the epitome of that concept. My friends, every time you come to Jesus hungry for spiritual food, I promise you will leave happy. Somebody needs to say amen. Amen. And if you haven't experienced that yet, my friends, I challenge you to do so. The problem is that too often we don't come. We don't take the time to come. We we have good intentions, but we don't take the time to come. So many other things are more important to us. Which leads me to the major point of our teaching today. I believe that this story reveals three more last day essentials. Number one, Jesus wants to feed us. And he can only do that when, he, when we recognize our hunger and come to him for spiritual food. That's called Bible study, friends. That's called spending time in his word. And he wants to feed us every day. He wants us to get into his word. He wants us to feast on his word. But, you know, we find so many other things that that, that can, uh, can crowd in there and take the place of that. Jesus wants us to make him first every day. And so he's inviting us to spend that special time in the study of his word. So many times people say, oh, I, I just don't have time, Pastor. You know, it's just tough to get up in the morning, get ready to, you know, to go to work and all this kind of stuff. And, and oh, you, you've got a dream life, Pastor. All you have, you know, you've got all these hours that you can spend studying the Bible. Well, friends, I face the same kind of challenges that you do. The devil throws his little rabbits in my uh, path, too. 
But I want to tell you, we must determine every day that we are going to make Jesus first. That we are going to take time with his word. And I think sometimes we, 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 we are overcome with this, uh, this idea that unless we spend an hour every day in his word, that somehow we're not going to cut it. Listen, you know, I have come to discover that if I even take five minutes that I am experiencing such, such satisfaction that Jesus sucks me into another five minutes and then another, you know, and, and, and it is just something that is so gratifying. Jesus longs us for us to taste and see that he is good. Number one, Jesus wants to feed us, and he wants to feed us every day. He doesn't want, he has compassion on us, friends, and he doesn't want us to go through the challenges of life without the food that he longs to offer us and that we so much need. Number one, Jesus wants to feed us. Number two, Jesus wants us to communicate with him. He doesn't intend for, for this thing to be a one-way street. When he feeds us, he wants us to communicate back with him. That's called prayer. When Jesus fed the 5,000, I'm sure there were many people that connected with him personally after that event, thanked him for it. Thank you, Lord, for this food that you gave us. They spoke with him. They encountered Jesus. Jesus wants us to have that kind of encounter with him. So number one, he wants us to have a, a, a study life, a Bible study life. Number two, he wants us to have a prayer life. He wants us to connect with him. And number three, Jesus wants us to communicate with others. Now when we spend time with Jesus, when he feeds us, when we share our needs with him and talk with him, then he wants us to go and tell others what he's done for us. That's called sharing. You know, I can only imagine the stories that must have been told by the recipients of that miracle that day, the feeding of the 4,000. You know, do you think that after they experienced that miracle that they went home and they kept their mouth shut and they didn't tell anybody about it? Uh-uh. You can bet they were telling every... You would not believe what Jesus did for me today. I was out there and I was hungry and Jesus gave me something to eat. And you know what, friends? Jesus wants us to do that same thing with others. As we encounter him through Bible study, as we talk to him through prayer, then Jesus wants to ignite us and, and go out and share that with other people. Do you believe that? Over the past several months, I've been enjoying a rich, daily, personal Bible study and prayer life with Jesus. And if something starts to crowd out my time with Him, I feel it. Things don't go right in my day. I've discovered that when I come to Jesus hungry, I always leave happy. Then as a natural consequence, I have a joy inside that I want to share Jesus with other people. Today, when you were given a bulletin, you probably saw this little lavender-colored sheet inside here. Personal spiritual inventory. If you haven't filled it out, I ask you to do so right now. I don't want your name. I want this to be entirely on anonymous, but I want to collect some data about the Simi Church. It's important. Now, if some of you are reticent to answer these questions, let me help you understand something. If you go to the doctor and you go for a physical examination, the doctor's going to ask you some questions because he wants to make sure that you are physically healthy. And if you're not, then he wants to remedy that. Amen? And the same thing holds true for the church. Friends, I am here as your spiritual shepherd to try to grow this body of believers, to, to help us understand the need to make Jesus first in our lives each and every day and to facilitate that process for each of you. And how can I know the needs of this, uh, of this church? How can I know how to respond unless I know your needs? And so I encourage you to take time to do that. Let me know this. Would you please just take a minute right now and fill this out if you haven't done so already? If some of you may have already dropped this in the offering plate. If you did, thank you. 
If you haven't done so, I'm just asking you to fold it over. I don't want to know who, who you are. Just fold it over, and today, as you walk out of church, give it to either Pastor Jan or myself, okay? I'm not going to quickly look and see, oh, Joe gave me that. No, I'm not going to do that. I want to know where this church is at. And let me tell you something, folks. Another reason why this is important, if we want to get to a destination, we've got to know the starting point. If somebody wants to get to Denver, Colorado, the road to Denver, Colorado, and the route to Denver, Colorado is a whole lot different from Chicago, Illinois, as it is from Los Angeles, California. And we need to know the information, so I'm asking you if you would just take a few moments to fill that out for your pastor. I want to know how what I can do to help foster and nurture the spiritual growth of this congregation. And so that information that you will share with me will be most helpful, and I thank you. Thank you for doing that. It's interesting to discover human nature. People have a physiological reaction when they get hungry. Blood sugar levels change. And a lot of times people can get real cranky. Some of you may know about that. Sometimes people, when they get real hungry physically, they even get mean-spirited. You ever notice that? Perhaps it's happened to you. It's amazing what a good meal will do to change that physiology. I believe we're living in the last days, amen? If you haven't noticed, there are a lot of cranky people out there in the world. They're rioting in the streets of the world. Whether it's Libya, Egypt, even places in the United States. There are a lot of cranky people. Could it be that the unrest in the world is a result of people's spiritual hunger? Could it be that they are acting out the fact that they have not been physically, uh, that they have not been spiritually fed? Matthew chapter 5 and verse 6 in the Sermon on the Mount, Jesus said, Blessed are those who hunger and thirst for righteousness, for they shall be, what? Filled. A key last day essential is to feast on the word of God, my friends. To daily sit at the feet of Jesus and allow him to spiritually feed us. Are you hungry? Nothing satisfies the hunger like Jesus. I challenge you today to spend time allowing Jesus to feed you from his word. Share with him your gratitude. Share with him your needs. Then, go share what Jesus has done for you with others. I promise you, my friends, if you come hungry, you will leave happy. Let's pray. Father, Thank you for being so amazing that you would send your dear son Jesus to take care of our needs. And this story that we've read about his encounter with feeding the 4,000 is a reminder that you long to feed us not with loaves and fish, but with the eternal bread. And so we invite you to feed us today. We want to come to you hungry, and we know that when we do, we will leave happy. We ask that, like the 4,000, that we will be filled and satisfied. Lord, I pray that you bless the people in this church, your people. We are living in the last days, and nothing could be more important than being ready for you when you come. So, Lord, in spite of the devil's efforts to get us down, May we find it each and every day important to make Jesus first, 
to take time feasting on your word, to spend time communicating with you, and then sharing that joy with others. Until at last, we can see you face to face and spend forever with you. May that day be soon, we ask and pray in Christ's name. Amen.